Good morning, church. Whenever I feel overwhelmed with a lot of things, I learn to call on to Him first before feeling worried or anxious. At the back of my head, I know that I should seek Him first because only He can supply my needs even if I don't know exactly what it is I need at that moment. It is said in Matthew that He already knows what you need before you ask Him, and that reality really amazes me. In my limited knowledge, I may not always understand what is happening in life, but in my heart, I trust that in every situation He puts me, He equips and supplies exactly what I need to go through it. And I pray that whenever you struggle in certain situations in life, may you lift it up to Him first and allow Him to control the situation. Trust that He is faithful and that He will sustain you. Let us prepare hearts for worship this morning by singing praises to Him who deserves all praise and glory. Sinner 
morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Please join me in prayer as we continue our worship today. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Sunday that you have given to us. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship you once again, Lord. You alone are the living God and you alone are worthy of our worship and praise. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for what he did on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for your continuous mercy, for your continuous grace to us, for your daily provisions, and for your continuous love for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sustaining us, Lord, throughout this pandemic and keeping us alive. Lord, we want to lift up to you our sister uh, Joanna and family, and we also lift up uh, the family of Clyde and Chad, Lord. We pray for healing, and may you comfort the family, Lord, as they uh, been uh, affected by this COVID, Lord. And Lord, we continue to pray for your protection in our country, especially that the new Delta variant uh, has arrived and has started to uh, gain uh, victims, Lord, uh, in the past week. And Lord, we also pray for the recent raining that we are experiencing, Lord, the flooding. We continue to pray for your protection and guidance. And Lord, we pray that uh, there will not be any flooding in areas that are low rise and those who, uh, in the provinces, uh, they will not experience landslide, Lord. And Lord, we just continue to pray for your protection and guidance uh, throughout uh, this uh, situation that we are in. And Lord, in humility, Lord, we pray for uh, open hearts and open minds as we come to your word. Forgive us, Lord, for any sins that uh, we have. Cleanse us, prepare our hearts, Lord. Open our eyes and our minds to your word as we listen to your word and help us, Lord, to apply it. And Lord, we pray that you will once again uh, light the fire in us. May our hearts once again burn to seek you and to serve you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that uh, our church will continue to grow, will continue to live for you, and will continue to encourage one another, Lord. Uh, we are one family. We are your body, your ambassador. And help us, Lord, to live our lives uh, worthy of that calling. And once again, we just uh, give you praise and we give you thanks. Uh, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Church. Once again, welcome to Lighthouse of Faith Tabernacle. I am very happy that uh, you can join us this morning for our worship service. This morning, we'll be talking about brave words, cowardly heart, and our passage is found in Jeremiah chapter forty-two to forty-three. It's a bit long. Uh, so we'll not be looking at every verse of these two chapters, but we'll be going through some of the more important key aspects of these two chapters. But before we go, let's play, some, let's play a little game. Okay, I'm going to quote some bold words and tell me if, or rather, since we're online and you cannot re really directly tell me Maybe you can guess, try, try guessing who said these words. Some of these words have been revised. Um, I, I, I modernized the wordings. And these are my words, but the, the, the key concept of what is being said belongs to the one who said it. So the first bold word here is, Our God is able to save us, but even if He doesn't save us, we will not bow down to you. Any guess as to who said these words? Take time to think about it. Our God is able to save us, but even if He doesn't save us, we will not bow down to you. Let me give you a clue. 
they are, if they do not bow down to this person they say they're going to bow down to, they will be put to death. In fact, they will be put in a fiery furnace. Yes, you have it correct. Basically, it's the three friends of Daniel who said these words. Let's try the second one. This is easier. Even if everyone should desert you, I will never abandon you. Even if everyone deserts you, I will never abandon you. Who said these words? Very bold words. Even if everyone should desert you, even if everyone should run away from you, I will never abandon you even to the end of my life. Who said these words? And let me give you another clue. The person who said these words actually didn't live up to what he said. He would actually get to deny Jesus Christ three times later on. And yes, it's the Apostle Peter. Okay, that's probably the easiest one of the lot. Let's go to the third words. This is harder, especially if you don't know your Old Testament. If you give me victory, I will sacrifice the first thing that comes out from my house when I return in victory. If you give me victory, I will sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house when I return in victory. Any guess? Let me give you another clue. It so happened that the first thing that came out of his house to meet him in his triumphal return to his home was actually his daughter. And basically, because of his promise to, to give the first thing that comes out of his house as a burnt sacrifice, he sacrificed his daughter to the Lord. And that person is none other than Jephthah. And if you're not familiar with his story, you can go to the book of Judges. It's there. Okay? Jephthah. Those are very bold words. Lord, I'm going to give you whatever comes out of my house. I don't know what will come out. A million dollars? My, um, my, my brand new car? I don't know what will come out, but whatever come out first will be given to you. And it so happened, it was more than a million dollars. It was more than a car. It was his daughter. And yet, he willingly went through with what he promised the Lord. The fourth bold word, this is not in the scriptures. Give me liberty or give me death. This is a very famous line. I don't know if you've heard of it. This is actually from one of the heroes in the United States by the name of Patrick Henry. He said, give me liberty or give me death. Masters, this morning we'd like to talk about bold words, cowardly heart. I'm sure all of us, we love bold words. In fact, uh, I have a collection of bold words that were spoken in movies that I love very much. I, I, I really love movies with bold words. One very good example is the movie Independence Day, where the president challenged the people. Today, it shall no longer be known as an American holiday, but it will be known when people from all over the world will rise up for their lives. I think that's a very beautiful and very strong statement from the president in that movie, Independence Day. But anyway, bold words are beautiful. It gives us encouragement. It, it immortalizes scenes. It immortalizes the person. And bold words gives us reason to hope. And this morning, we'll be looking at a very important bold word that was spoken. However, the problem was, like many of us, a lot of times we declare bold declarations to the Lord or even to friends or even to our parents. We make bold declaration, but we never follow through. And that's what we will be looking at this morning. And our passage will be found in Jeremiah chapter 42. But before we go to Jeremiah chapter 42, let me give you a little background of what was going on. Understand that when the book of Jeremiah was written, it was during 586 B.C. or after 586 B.C. What happened in 586 B.C.? Well, for the very first time, Babylon conquered Jerusalem. If you know your history, you know that 
the kingdom of, of Israel was conquered by Assyria in 722 BC. And Babylon has been conquering uh, the kingdom of Judah. The, the sister nation, uh, Israel, was already gone. And now Babylon is attacking the kingdom of Judah. And many parts of Judah has already been destroyed, been, been conquered. And now Babylon sets its sight on Jerusalem, the capital of the city. And it so happened that Babylon was able to conquer Jerusalem destroy the walls of Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and even plundered the nation. But the interesting thing here is that the Babylonians never destroyed everyone. The Babylonians, they were in the habit of leaving a little group of people behind, what we call the remnants. And interestingly, because God actually prophesied that when Babylon comes, they will destroy most of the people, but they will leave a handful of people in the land which we call remnants. Well, the Babylonians did exactly that, probably because they believed that it would not be pleasing to their Babylonian gods if they would perform a genocide and kill off everyone. And, of course, the reality, the practicality of it is that they have to leave someone behind to take care of the land so that the land will continue to produce and be productive. Because if you kill off everyone in that land, no one will be there to continue to cultivate the land for future. And so that's what they did. They leave a group of people, the remnants behind, to take care of the land. Now here is where we come to the gist of our story. Let me tell you about three persons, three personalities that is involved that will bring us to our story. First, the person by the name of Gedaliah. Gedaliah was the son of Ahikam. And when, Babi, when Babylon conquered Israel and Israel fell, as I said, the Babylonian king decided to leave a remnant, a group of people behind to take care of the land. And the Babylonians appointed Gedaliah to be the governor of the land. Basically, he was in charge over all Israel. And the interesting thing is when the Babylonians left and went back to Babylon, and the people who were scattered because of the attack of, Is of, of Babylon, they were scattered to different parts of the world. When they heard that ba the Babylonians had retreated back to, their, to, to Babylon, and they heard that Gedaliah was now in charge of the land, in fact, the land was actually doing very well. And so they all decided to go back. Look at Isaiah chap uh, Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 12. They, the, the people who were scattered all over around, Jeru uh, around Israel, they all came back to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah from all the countries where they had scattered. And they harvested an abundance of wine and summer fruit. Well, the, the, the theory of the Babylonians was right. You leave the people there, they will continue to cultivate the land. In fact, we see that it was very productive. They had an abundance of wine, basically grapes. And they had summer fruit all around. Although Israel and Jerusalem lies in ruin, although the once glorious temple of the Lord lies in ruin, God was with them and continued to bless them. They had abundance in food production. The second person I want us to, to, to be introduced to is the name Johanan. Johanan. Johanan, um, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 15, it tells us that Johanan was, uh, let me go back. Johanan, basically Johanan was um, an Israelite who approached Gedaliah. He went to Gedaliah and they, he, he, he gave an information, a very crucial information to Gedaliah. He told Gedaliah, Gedaliah, I have heard that the Ammonites are planning to send Ishmael to assassinate you. The Ammonites, they were longtime enemies of Israel. If you've been to Israel, you understand. If you've been to the Holy Land, you understand the Ammonites, they belong to the city of Amman. We've been there. Amman. It's actually in the Jordan area. The, sea, the, the country of Jordan. 
And basically, Mispah is somewhere close to Ammon. Uh, Gedaliah was in Mispah, and the Ammonites, they saw that the Israelites, they are, repro- they are producing again. They are being productive again, even though they have just been destroyed by Babylon. And they felt that we have to do something because Israel might become a powerful nation again, and then we would not be, we would not be able to destroy them. And so, while Israel was still struggling, the, Ammon- the Ammonites decided, let's try to put to death the leader of the Israelites, Gedaliah. And so, according to Johanan, he received information. And this is very interesting because during those times, they don't have wiretaps, they don't have um, camera, especially um, distance cameras. They don't have those things. And it's very interesting how Johanan would come up with the information that Ishmael was sent from Ammonites, from the Ammonites, to kill Gedaliah. Well, as I said, it sounds absurd because during those times, information doesn't come easy, especially coming from the enemy's side. And that's probably one reason why Gedaliah didn't believe Johanan's news. Johanan was so insistent. Look at Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 15. In Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 15, look at what Johanan said. Johanan, son of Karea, said privately to Gedaliah in Mizpah, Let me go and kill Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, and no one will know. No one will have to know. We'll keep your name in the dark so that your name will not be um, blemished. I will be the one to kill him. Why should he take your life and cause all the Jews who are gathered around you to be scattered? Israel is just starting. If he kills you, no one will lead these Israelites. And once again, the people of God may be scattered. So let's put an end to this assassination plot. Let me be the, the, the counter agent. Let me be the one to assassinate Ishmael before he can do something to you. And here is where we see our third person, Ishmael. Well, Ishmael, after seven months, after seven men, months in Gedaliah, heard the news. Seven months. It took seven months of careful planning. Seven months before Ishmael put into action his plans. So Ishmael came to Mizpah with ten men with him on the guys that they wanted to have fellowship with Gedaliah. Again, Gedaliah didn't believe the news that Ishmael was there to kill him. So he welcomed, him, he welcomed them to his home. Can you imagine that? He welcomed his would-be killer to his own home. And had feast with them. And while they were high in spirits and eating, Ishmael assassinated and killed Gedaliah. Not only did he, was he satisfied in killing Gedaliah, he went on to kill many Israelites. And after killing many Israelites, he made all the rest of the people captives. Can you imagine just 10 of them, uh, rather just 11 of them, and they were able to capture the whole of Israel. That's how weak Israel was at the time. There was none, there was no one who was able to do combat. He took captive every Israel in Mizpah and set to return to Ammonites with them across the Jordan. He wanted to bring them back to his nation as his slaves. And here is where Johanan once again enters the picture. Johanan heard what Ishmael had done. He took all the men with him and went to fight against Ishmael. Ishmael and his men were defeated, but they were able to escape to Ammonites, to the Ammonites. And so when Ishmael escaped, he could not bring the captives with him anymore. And so Johanan was satisfied that they were victorious and that they were able to save the captives. They were able to save the captives. So, Ishmael is now out of the picture. And when Johanan and the Israelites went back to Mizpah, Johanan now realized that they have another problem. 
In fact, it was a bigger problem at hand. How will the Babylonians now react that Gedaliah is dead? The, the appointed governor, Babylonians appointed Gedaliah to be the governor and he was killed. Would the Babylonians lash out against them? Would the Babylonians, who is more powerful, who was a more powerful nation than the Ammonites, really listen to their reasons? What if the Babylonians accused them of killing Gedaliah? What if they di didn't believe the assassination story? What if they didn't listen to reason? And Johanan had all these questions bothering him. What if Babylonian came back? And in their rage that we killed the governor that they have set up here, they might want to kill all of us. The first time they allowed us to live, it was only by mercy that we were allowed to live. But the second time around, that may not be the case anymore. And so they were afraid. They had all these possible scenarios running through their, uh, through their minds. Surely, their heads would be on the chopping block. Now, at least that's what they thought. Surely, when the Babylonians came, we're dead. If the Babylonians should come back, we are dead. And so the first thing that came to their mind, we need to run away. We need to run away. The best the de they decided that the best course of action was to find refuge in Egypt. Because Egypt at the time was still a powerful nation. Although it is not as powerful as Babylon, but it is still a powerful nation. And so they decided, let's go to Egypt. Surely, the Babylonians won't start a war against Egypt just because of us. It's very much like the Philippines these days. The Philippines, we are caught in a battle between two giants, the battle of America and China. And we're saying that if we side with one, surely the other will not bother us. Because if they bother us, it will be the cause for world war. That's exactly what the Israelites were thinking. Johanan, that's exactly what he was thinking. Let's go to Egypt because Egypt is a big nation. It's a powerful nation. Surely Babylonians will not ignite a war. You see, for the Israelites at this time, actually for the longest time, the Israelites think of Egypt as their safety net. It was their safety blanket, their lucky charm. They reverted to the, to the very scenes of their fathers during the time of the Exodus. Remember that the time of the Exodus, the, their fathers who came out of Egypt together with Moses, every time they had some miscomfort, every time they had problems, they would always threaten Moses. Moses, we will go back to Egypt. Why? Because here, you cannot give us food. In Egypt, we have meat. In Egypt, we have fish. In Egypt, we have all sorts of food. In Egypt, we are safe. Why should we bother going with you into this wilderness for 40 years? You see, from the very beginning, the Israelites always think of Egypt as their safety net. We go there. We will be saved there. And here is where Jeremiah comes in. You see, Mizpah is located in the northern area of the eastern part of Israel the northeast of Israel. And so, they were planning to go down all the way to Egypt, which is in the southwest part of Israel. From northeast, they were going to go down a very long path towards Egypt. And on their way to Egypt, they came across Jeremiah. And they knew Jeremiah to be a prophet of the Lord. And they decided to send a group of people to Jeremiah to talk to him to plead with him. And this is what they pled with him. Now look at Jeremiah 42, verse 2 to 3. Please hear our petition and pray to the Lord your Father, your God for this entire remnant. Please pray for us. Pray, pray for all of us. For as you now see, though we were once many, now only a few are left. 
pray that the Lord your God will tell us where we should go and what we should do. Pray to God to give us His direction that we may know His will, that we may know what He wants us to do. And that was basically the request of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you are a prophet of the Lord. Surely the Lord will give you answers. Please go and ask what He wants us to do, what His will is for us. 42 verse 5 to 6, They said to Jeremiah, <clears throat> May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with everything the Lord your God sent you to tell us. And they were telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, whatever the Lord tells you, we swear in the name of the Lord, we swear. In the name of God our Father, we swear. In fact, He is the witness to this promise. That whatever He tells us, whether it's favorable to us or unfavorable to us, we will act accordingly. We will do everything you tell us to do. We will obey the Lord, no matter the, the consequences. In short, they were telling, tell us what God's will is. We will obey it no matter what the consequences may be. Because that will always be the best course of action. Whatever God's will is, we believe it will be always for the best. And we will obey it no matter what the consequence may be. Jeremiah promised to pray for them and to reveal to them what God would want for them. And so Jeremiah went to his room and started praying for the remnants of Israel. The Israelites who were waiting for an answer, they stayed there and waited and waited. All this time, they were afraid that the Babylonians may suddenly come in and attack them. But they waited for the answer of Jeremiah. It took Jeremiah 10 days, 10 days in faithful prayer before an answer came to them. And so when the answer came, Jeremiah now gives them the answer. If you look at verse 10 to 11, this is basically what the Lord tells them. If you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you, for I am grieved over the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you are now afraid of, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. It's a beautiful promise. And the Lord is saying, as long as you stay in this land, you will be saved. That's a guarantee. That's a guarantee. As long as you stay in this land, I will save you. And the Lord goes on to say in verse 12, I will show you compassion so that he, the king of Babylon, will have compassion on you and restore you to your land. It's very interesting because they're afraid that the king of Babylon will come and kill, of them, kill all of them. And now God was saying, guess what? If you stay in this land, the king of Babylon will come but not to kill you. In fact, I will change his heart. And he will ha have a heart of compassion. He will be compassionate to you. Can you imagine that? The killer will be compassionate to them. And that's basically what God is promising them. The one person you're afraid, who will kill you, will actually be compassionate instead. It's the exact opposite of what they were hoping for of what they were expecting of. But the Lord does not end there. There's a very big contrast to this promise of God. Look at verse 13 to 14. And God continues to tell them. Jeremiah continues to tell them. However, if you say, we will not stay in this land and so disobey the Lord your God, and if you say, no one will go and live in Egypt, no, uh, no we will go, and live in Egypt where we will not see war or hear the trumpet or be hungry for food. And they were, and Jeremiah is saying, but make sure you understand. If you stay in this land, God will bless you. But if you decided we will not stay in this land, we will disobey what God wants us to do, we will go live in Egypt where when we go to Egypt, surely there will be no war. When we go to Egypt, surely we will 
not be hungry for bread. There will be plenty of food. If you do that, what will happen? Verse 13 to 14. If you are determined to go to Egypt and you do go to settle there, then the sword you fear will overtake you there. And the famine you dread will follow you into Egypt and there you will die. Indeed, all who are determined to go to Egypt to settle there will die by the sword, famine, and plague. Not one of them will survive or escape the disaster I will bring on them. And the Lord was telling them, guess what? You decide to go to Egypt? You think it will save you? Think again. Because what I have promised, what you have been fearing the most, I will make sure that it will hunt you down. The sword you're afraid of, it will hunt you down. It will strike all of you. The famine that you are so afraid of, you think Egypt will be able to save you because Egypt has abundance? Guess what? Even the whole of Egypt will have to experience famine because of you. I will bring famine upon Egypt because of you. And even there, your security blanket, your safety net, will not have enough food for anyone to eat. You will die there. Indeed, I'm going to go beyond what you are fearing. You're afraid of the sword. You're afraid of famine. I will bring them upon you, but I will go beyond that. I will bring plagues upon you. And guess what? Not one of you will survive. Test me in this. Go to Egypt. And I guarantee not one of you will survive. The words of the Lord were very clear. Surely the Israelites would have enough sense to follow what the Lord said. After all, they just made some very bold declaration. Whatever you say, whether favorable or unfavorable, we will obey. But that's not what happened. And that's sadly oftentimes what happens when we make bold declarations. We, our pride takes a fall. We suddenly realize, oops, I spoke too soon. Look at what happened. Look at how they responded to the words of the Lord. In in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 2 to 3, this is what they say. Azariah, son of Hoshaya, and Johanan, son of Kariah, And all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, You are lying. The Lord our God did not send you to say, You must not go to Egypt to settle there. But Baruch, son of Neriah, is inciting you against us so that we will be handed over to the Babylonians and that they will kill us and carry us into exile into Babylon. Surely you are lying. Surely there's another plot to destroy us. And this time, not coming from the Babylonians, not coming from the Ammonites, not even from the Egyptians, but from our own people, Jeremiah and Baruch, the prophet of the Lord and the scribe. Surely you are plotting against us because you don't want any of us to survive. That's why you want us to stay so that when the Babylonians came, we will all die. You are lying. You are lying. And so with that, they decided, we will go to Egypt. And to make matters worse, they decided to kidnap Jeremiah against his will and bring him to Egypt as well. Brothers and sisters, we will not go on discussing what happened to them. That's not, our, that's not the point of this message this morning. But I want us to focus on their words and why suddenly they grew a cowardly heart. After all the bold declarations they had, they had a cowardly heart. In spite of the present fruitfulness of the land, remember they had an abundance of harvest of wine and summer fruit, the land was abundant. They were being productive in the land. In spite of the present fruitfulness that they are enjoying, in spite of the promise that God gave them, What did the Lord said? If you stay, I will bless you. If you stay, the Lord will have compassion of you. If you stay, the Lord will bless you. 
in spite of the punishment that was to come. If you live, you will surely all die. Logic dictates with all these three things coming together. First, there was fruitfulness within the land. Stay in the land. You will have enough food. You have seen the land was fruitful. Why would you leave? Why are you complaining about nothing to eat when the land is actually is producing so much? Secondly, God has promised them, if you stay, you will be blessed. If you stay, there will be so much for you. And of course, there's that whining of punishment. If you leave and if you go to Egypt, you will all surely die there. I will hunt you down and I will strike you down to death. Funny thing is, in spite of all the logic all that logic tells us that surely we are to obey, they decided to defy God. They defied God and went to Egypt anyway. My sisters, that's the problem of our cowardly hearts. Cowardly hearts. Why do they have cowardly hearts? Because they fear the Babylonians more than they fear God. They feared the Babylonians more than they feared God. They felt that the Babylonians, we have seen their power. We have seen how they destroyed Jerusalem. We have seen Babylonians destroying all nations around them. Babylonia, the Babylonians at this time was becoming a great empire under Nebuchadnezzar. And nations around Babylonians have been conquered left and right. And the Israelites, they saw the power of, Israel, of the Babylonians. And that's why... At this point, they were more afraid of the Babylonians than they were afraid of God. And they forgot that it was actually God who prophesied. It was actually God who prophesied that I am sending the Babylonians to you. A nation that is far worse than you are. And they will destroy your nation because you have sinned against me. They forgot. They forgot that it was because of their sins that the Babylonians actually conquered them in the first place. If they were to be afraid, <coughs> if they were to be afraid of anyone, <coughs> if they were to be afraid of anyone, it was not the Babylonians. It was the one who sent the Babylonians to them. They had to be afraid of God. Because God had the power to send the Babylonians again. God has the power to destroy them because of their sins, because of their disobedience. But you see, a lot of times this is our problem. Because the physical danger that we see is more tangible. And that's why we fear the physical dangers more than we fear the punishment of God. For one thing, we think that this is more tangible, this is more real. And spiritually, the punishment of God, we feel that it's spiritual. It's not real because we have a misconception that the physical is the reality. And that's a lot of problem many times. We think the physical is more real than the spiritual. On another, on another sense, they were more afraid of the Babylonians more than they are afraid of God is because the Babylonians are more ruthless and God is more merciful. Surely God will forgive us if we sin against Him. Surely God will still have compassion on us. Brothers and sisters, a lot of times this is how we argue. Argue for our sinfulness. Argue for continually disobeying God. The danger is real. God is merciful. Let me go with disobeying God so that I don't have to face this physical danger. The second reason why they have a cowardly heart is because they believe that their course of action was the better one. Surely God is wrong. Surely Jeremiah was lying. Why? Because staying here doesn't make sense. The Babylonians are about to come and they might kill us. There's a very big possibility of him coming to kill us. Going to Egypt, that would be the best course of action. Because going to Egypt, surely the Babylonians will not chase after that in another nation, in another powerful nation. It's the best course of action. 
resistors, a lot of times we declare with our mouth, God's will is always for our best. We know that in our minds. We know that in our doctrine. We know that in our beliefs. We believe that God's will is always for the best. But here's the problem. When push comes to show, a lot of times we resort back to disobeying God's will and would rather choose our own will. We would rather choose our own way. Why? Because sometimes the will of God doesn't make sense. And the will of God sometimes doesn't make sense, especially if you're not walking close with God. The Bible says that God gives us a peace beyond understanding when we are in Christ Jesus. You see, for us Christians, we have this peace. If you are truly walking with God, whatever danger there may be outside, Delta variant, the, the, the rain, the storm, the flood, we have peace submitting ourselves to the Lord because we know that what He wants for us is always for our best, even when we do not make sense, when, when things do not make sense. Even though we do not understand why such a pandemic would happen and kill more than 35, 35 million people all over the world. We don't understand these things. But we have peace because we know that we have a God who knows what is best. Because we understand that our view, our vision is limited. And there are a lot of blind spots to our visions. And yet, when, the, when push comes to shove, a lot of times we throw away our minds, we throw away our doctrines, we throw away what we know and what we believe for practicality's sake. Surely my course of action is always better. Surely my decision is for my good. Surely my decision is actually better than what God wants me to do. Pay the taxes, my business will not survive. Surely I know better. Resistors, be careful about this kind of thinking. Be very careful about this kind of thinking. Never compromise. Never think that you know better. Thirdly, they have, they have cowardly hearts because they trusted the security of Egypt more than God's promises. They trusted the security of Egypt more than God's promises. Egypt has always been powerful. Egypt has always been a helper of Israel. Surely, we can always find a refuge in Egypt. Surely, the security in Egypt will be more tangible. Again, the word tangible is very dangerous. Because when we talk about tangible, we're only talking about physical aspects. We never talk about the spiritual aspects. The promises of God, it's intangible. It's in the future. We don't even know for sure if it's coming. But here, the security that Egypt pre presents to us, this is sure. This is secure. Let's take on what we can hold on to right now. Let's take on what is secure right now and not wait for what might be. And a lot of times we miss out on God's promises because of this kind of cowardly heart, because of this kind of thinking. Fourth, they were already made up in their hearts what they wanted to do. Before even coming to Jeremiah and asking him to pray, they were already decided, we're not going to listen to him. Even though they made bold declarations, They've already decided we're going to Egypt. We're just here for confirmation that this is what God wanted. We just want an affirmation from God. Resisters, be careful about this. A lot of times, when we pray, we're not truly praying. 
when we pray, we're not truly asking God for His best. A lot of times when we pray, our minds are already decided, Lord, I want this, and it should be this, nothing else. We think that it's faith. We think that it's boldness of our faith. Lord, I want this. Let this be it and not, no other options. But you see, that's not, the, that's not how prayer is supposed to work. We don't come demanding from God. We don't come insisting on what we want. We'll talk about that later. But let's look at brave words. Brave words. We love brave words. Why? Because first and foremost, brave words, they always sound so noble and heroic. We love to be, hear people declare bold words. In fact, we want to declare bold words ourselves because it sounds so noble and heroic. And if you are a Christian and you are men of bold words, you sound very spiritual. You sound very spiritual. I'm going to go to Timbuktu. I'm going to go to North Korea and be a missionary there. Come what may. We make bold declarations. And it sounds so noble. It sounds so heroic. Understand that brave words oftentimes doesn't truly reflect the heart. Brave words oftentimes doesn't truly reflect what's really going on in the heart. Words are oftentimes disassociated with what is really going on within our hearts. And that's why brave words is oftentimes cheap and empty. Oftentimes, not always. Because we have seen people who have declared great things and followed through. But for the majority of us, for every one person who actually followed through with his brave words, there are thousands who negate on their, na on their brave words. And brave words, unless accompanied by action, will always be cheap and empty. And that's why brave words are often the words that comes out from hypocrites. They want to pretend to be something they are not. They declare bold things so that people will think they are someone they are not. And sometimes, brave words are used to attempt, in an attempt to bribe God. Lord, I'm going to do this if you will do this for me. Lord, I promise next year, all my savings will be given to you if you will save me, if you will guide me, if you will bless my business. A lot of times we make bold, bold words, but we never really meant any of them. Why? We just simply wanted to bribe God. We think that by making bold words, by making, um, by making an oath to the Lord, the Lord is more likely to listen. That's what we thought. But you see, Making vows is not necessary in the eyes of the Lord. Remember the parable of the two sons? Jesus talked about these two sons, about a father who approached them individually. And the father asked them, asked one of them, why are you lying down there? Go to the vineyard and work the vineyard. And the, the, the one said, I don't want to. I want to continue lying here. But later on, he went to the vineyard and worked the vineyard, in spite of first saying, I don't want to. And then the father went to the second son. And the same thing he said, go to the vineyard and work the vineyard. The second son said, yes, I will do so, father. But he never did. And Jesus looked at the crowd and asked this question. Who do you think is justified? Who do you think is more righteous between the two brothers? And the crowd was unanimous, of course. The one who said he will not, but in the end, went and do it anyway. And Jesus Christ brought the hammer down. He looked at the crowd, the Pharisees that were there, and he said to them, You know what? 
These people, they keep talking about repentance, repentance, repentance. They talk about following the law, but they never do. They are like this brother who said, yes, I will do it, but never went and do it. And Jesus is saying, look at these adulterers. Look at these sinners. Look at these tax collectors. They were people who disobeyed God. They were people who were going against God. But in the end, when Jesus came upon them, they repented. And they decided, I'm no longer going to live the way I used to. Brothers and sisters, it's not about bold words. It's not about making a promise that I will do this or do that. But it's really about going out there and doing it. That's the more important part. Sometimes the Lord will tell us to do things that may not seem appealing to us. And a lot of times we will put it off and off and off. Lord, I will do it. I promise I will do it tomorrow. Then we put it off again. I promise I will do it next month. Then we put it off again. Masters, it's not about making those promises. The Lord doesn't want our promises. Because promises, they are empty unless they are backed up by our actions. James, the book of James tells us, do not merely be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. But Jesus is here telling us, do not merely be saying the words, but be doers of your words. I think Jesus is saying something more important here. Do not merely say one thing and not do it. Be a man of your word. Go out and do what you have promised. You said that you're going to follow God whether that, the result is favorable or, or unfavorable. Unfair, Do it. Follow Him. For our application this morning, the first application I want us to understand is this. Understand that God is never impressed by our bold declarations. Understand that God is never impressed by our bold declarations whether it's in our prayers, whether it's in our songs. Remember our songs? I will go to the ends of the earth. We make bold, we sing bold declarations in our songs. Nakakalungkot. We tell the Lord, Lord, to the ends of the earth, I will go there, but we cannot even go across the street to share the gospel. We make bold declarations. Brothers and sisters, Understand that God is never impressed by our bold declarations. The Lord knows us inside out and He accepts us as we are. Don't make bold declarations. Come to Him. Admit to God your fears. Admit to God you're afraid the Babylonians are coming. That they may kill us. Admit to God your weakness. Lord, I want to have faith. I want to trust your promises, but my faith is weak. Help me, Lord. Admit your sinfulness to the Lord. Lord, I've been fighting this sin over and over and over again. And victory seems to elude me over and over again. Lord, I want to overcome this sin, but I am weak. Help me. Masters, the Bible tells us that a broken spirit and a contrite heart the Lord will never despise. We don't have to pretend to be someone who is courageous. We don't have to pretend that we will be doing some great majestic thing for the Lord. Pretending is always very tiresome. Pretending is tiresome. It wears us down. Rather than pretending, come to the Lord as you are. Because before the Lord, you are an open book. He knows every part of who you are. Your pretensions doesn't really fly in the sight of the Lord. Understand that God is never impressed by our bold declaration. I really love this song. In the 1980s, this song was sung by um, Twyla Paris. He, uh, he was the original, she was the original artist who sang this song. The warrior is a child. I really love the lyrics of this song. Why don't we 
uh, take this time to listen to this song. And this is a song that was rendered by Gary Valenciano. I, I hope and pray that you will take this time to just quiet down and listen and focus on the lyrics of this song. Isn't that a beautiful song? People don't really know who we are. Outsidely, we may look like a warrior, we may look like Superman, but inwardly, many of us are really courageous, a cowardly lot. And it's okay to be cowardly. Admit it. Don't try to hide it. Don't be like Johanan and his group. Tell the Lord. Admit to the Lord your weaknesses. 
Secondly, prayer is never about getting the result we want. Johanan and his group were not looking for answers. They, were, they wanted God to consent to their decision. They wanted God's stamp of approval. They didn't want an answer. They wanted God to affirm their plan. They never really cared for God's will. All those bold words that they declared were just for show. They de- you see, we have to understand one very important truth. As Christians, God hears and answers all our prayers. God hears and answers all our prayers. And I mean all our prayers. God hears and answers all our prayers. But He doesn't grant all our prayers. There's a very big difference. God hears and answers. But His answer isn't always granting of our prayer request. And we need to understand the difference. When we come to the Lord in prayer, understand that not all our requests will be granted. It's not about us getting the result we want when we pray. It's rather submitting our will to the will of God. It's actually coming to prayer. And when we come to prayer, it's actually telling the Lord, Lord, this is what I want. But let your will be done, not my will, because your will will always be the best. Lord, this is what I want, but my vision is limited. I don't know what will happen if I take on this path, but you know, and I'm going to submit myself to your will. Brothers and sisters, it is my prayer that when we pray, this will be the motivation of our prayer. Pray in such a way that you are always surrendering to whatever God has for you, whether the result may be favorable or unfavorable. Because in the long run, favorable and favor- unfavorable is just, um, is just subjective to you. It's just relative to you. Because in the long run, whether the result may be favorable or unfavorable to you, it will always be for your best. And it is my prayer that we will learn this lesson very well. Third, understand that we are, sup- we are never to go up against God. Never, ever go up against God. Never challenge God. Simon Wells, Simon Wells, Wales said these very beautiful words. Isn't it the greatest possible disaster when you wrestle with God not to be beaten? Isn't it the greatest possible disaster when you wrestle with God not to be beaten? It's the greatest disaster. It's the greatest disaster to struggle with God and hoping to come out a winner over God. Because you will continue fighting, fighting, fighting to the very end. And guess what? In the end, you always lose. No one who fights against God will ever win. Satan knows that. And nakakalungkot, if Satan knows that, how come we still, we, we, we act as if we don't know that. We continue to go against His will for us. We continue to fight against God's decision for us. God's moral plans, God's moral will for us. If you think that you will win, you are deluding yourself. Resisters, never go up against God. In Chinese, we have this term, to pe tian. I don't know if you've heard those words. To pe tian. Uh, to basically is asking. You're asking something. Pe is skin. And tian is pain. Basically, to pe tian is saying, I'm asking for pain. I'm asking to be hurt. And basically, when we were kids, that's the term that my mother would always use on me. Why do you want to get hurt? I'm telling you to study. You don't want to study. I'm going to spunk you and spunk you until you study. In the end, you will still study. So why go through the hurt? Are you sadistic? Or rather masochist? 
Are you a masochist that you want to get hurt before you actually do what you're supposed to do? Why not do it in the first place? Why go against the will of the Lord? Because in the long run, in the ultimate end, you will still be obeying God's will. It's very interesting because people today who do not believe in Jesus Christ, the atheist, the anti-theist, the LGBTQ, people who don't believe in God, they don't want to bow down to God. Remember Pharaoh? That was also Pharaoh's stance. Who is this God that I should let you go and worship him? Who, should the, who is this God that I should obey him? In the end, Pharaoh obeyed God after 10 plagues that decimated Egypt. In the end, he gave in. Topetia. The atheists would also be facing the same situation. They don't want to bow down to God. They don't want to acknowledge the existence of God. They don't want to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus. Well, they're just simply asking for more pain because the Bible promised that one day every tongue in heaven and on earth and every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue in heaven and earth will declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father and every knee will bow. Brothers and sisters, in the long run, even the atheists will have to bow down to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the sad part is, they will only do that when they are already in hell, when they are already suffering the eternal flames of hell. Why go through the pain? Why suffer when you could actually do what God wanted you to do today? Don't put off what God wants you to do. Do it today. Don't continue to struggle with God. Don't continue to negotiate with God. Because in the end, you know you will still be doing that because God is a sovereign God. In the end, you will still submit to the will of God because that's you. That's sovereignty of God. In the end, you will still be doing what God wants you to do. The difference, the process is longer, the process is more painful. As opposed to when you just simply submit to Him now. Lastly, let me remind us to be men of our word. These men, they made bold declarations, but they never followed through. The Bible says if you cannot make this bold declaration, if you cannot follow through your bold declaration, then don't make those declarations. But if you do make those declarations, follow through to the very end, no matter what the consequence is. Christians, if we do not become men of our word, of our word, if we do not act out what we say we will, we become untrustworthy. We lose our reputation. And in doing so, we lose our right, our influence to share the gospel with those who are lost. Why would they believe us when we talk about the gospel, when they cannot believe us when we say that we will come to their meeting, when we will be on time, when we will do this and do that for them? You see, if we cannot be trusted in these little things, chances are they will not trust us for eternity as well. My sisters, be men of our word. Sad part because today, this is a rare thing. Today, words are so many. And people, it, it feels like it's okay to just blubber over and over again. And the sad part is, we have become so accustomed to making promises that we don't plan on keeping. To making commitments that we have no intention of fulfilling. My sisters, I pray that we will not be so. Let us continue to be men of our word. Whatever we have said, let's do it. Let us not simply be listeners to the word. Let's not simply be listeners 
let's simply not be sayers, but let's be doers as well. My sisters, let's do what we have promised. Let us be promise, promise keepers, keeping every promise that we have ever made. My sisters, it is my prayer that remember I'm not saying that brave words are wrong. I'm not saying that brave words are wrong. In fact, my conclusion is this. Brave words, brave hearts. Brave words, brave hearts. Do not be like Johanan and his men who have brave words but cowardly hearts. Rather, as Christians, let us have brave words and courageous hearts for the glory of God. Whatever we have promised the Lord, whatever we have promised the people around us, no matter what the consequence may be, let's be doers of our word. Why don't we come to the Lord in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you, Father, for this promise, for these reminders. Father, indeed, as we look back our lives, we can see and be reminded of so many bold promises that we have made, both to you and to the people around us. And Father, truth be, to truth be told, many of those promises were never fulfilled. And chances are many of those promises never will be fulfilled. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Father, for being haphazard with our words, for being careless when we make promises and oaths. Forgive us, Father, if we had put you to shame because of the way we live our lives, because of the way we treat our words. And it's my prayer, Father, that even as we understand this truth this morning, May you raise up Christians who not only have brave heart words, Father, but that we would also have courageous hearts, hearts willing to take the adventure with you, no matter what the consequence may be, because your will will always be for our good. Father, we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you that we have a good God. We thank you because you are the God who will never leave us nor forsake us. And we can always put our trust in you. Father, we commit this morning into your hands, our brothers and sisters who are not feeling well. We pray, Father, for Johanna and, his, and her family, Sherwin, for Josh, for Hart. We pray, Father, for Clyde and his parents who are now suffering um, from uh, COVID-19. We thank you, Father, that their cases are mild. And we continue to pray, Father, for us your healing touch upon them. We pray, Father, for uh, isolating them, Father, so that no one else will be affected by them. And I pray, Father, for a quick recovery, Father, for them. Lord, I pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters, especially in Northern Luzon, especially in Visayas and Mindanao that are suffering so much from the flood and the rain from this typhoon, Fabian. We pray, Father, for your mercy upon them. We pray, Father, for your provisions upon them, O Lord. Father, on top of the pandemic, this typhoon has brought about so much damage, O Lord. And I believe that many of our many of our countrymen have come to the point of starvation, have come to the point of extreme poverty. Father, we pray that you would continue to use Christians to be courageous, to be brave, to go out there and make a difference in the lives of these people who are suffering. Lord, I pray for your mercy. I pray, Father, for grace. I pray for your compassion. Father, once again, we lift up our church into your hands. We thank you also, Father, as we are reminded that today, our sister church, 
Makati Hope Fellowship is celebrating their anniversary as well. Father, we pray that you would bless this church, you would continue to see this church grow. Bless Pastor Christian as he leads this church for your glory. And we pray, Father, for the leadership of Makati Hope Fellowship. Continue to be with them and bless them. Guide them and give them a vision for what we want this church to be. Father, once again, we thank you and we continue to lift up our church into your hands as well. We pray, Father, especially for our desire to have a church building of our own. Father, it is our prayer that you would guide this church. You'd help us move towards the vision that you have entrusted to us and to fulfill it and to bring up a next generation of believers who will walk in your ways. Father, we thank you that you are our God and that you are beautiful beyond description. We thank you because you promised that you'd never leave us nor forsake us. And in you, we can always anchor our hope and trust. Once again, Father, even as we continue on, Father, with um, this new week that, it, that comes, even in the, in, in, in the midst of the Delta variant um, approaching, we continue to pray, Father, and continue to trust in you. Be with us, and I pray that you'd continue to use us to be your channels of grace and peace. For your glory and honor, in the mighty name Jesus we pray. Amen and Amen. Our worship service ends here, but I continue to pray for each one of you that you will keep safe, especially with the oncoming Delta variant. I pray that all of us will continue to be vigilant and to continue to hold on to this um, minimum health protocols to keep ourselves safe. Um, I pray that each of you would continue to have a courageous heart uh, especially as you go through this coming week, that you would continue to stand up for God, that you would continue to st stand up for the truth, no matter what situation you are in. Do not cower, do not cower in fear, but stand up for the Lord, because the Lord has given us a spirit of, and uh, the Lord did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. May we continue to be a difference maker, especially to our communities. God bless. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone.